this is fun. You and I are going to have to stand close together because we got one microphone. Uh, I want to tell you uh, an interesting story that uh, how I got to meet Mara. Dr. Larry Richards, uh, arguably one of the smartest people I've ever met. Uh, if you've ever got, had a Zondervan study Bible, he wrote the study notes. So uh, he's a bright man. And Dr. Larry Richards came into Cal State Christian University, where I'm the president, and he was teaching a course on freedom. And he was taking people through the Gospels, talking about demon possession and all of that sort of stuff, and demonization and how we get trapped. And one of the things that he did during the class was invite Dr. Kraft to come. Now, I want to tell you about Mara. We spent $7,000 to get her to the class. What we did, any of you remember a man by the name of Frank Pastore? Yeah. We advertised on the Frank Pastore show about this class. Mara was the only one who showed up. We had our regular students, and we had some folks from TM that came down, but Mara was the only one who came, and it was because God was about to do something miraculous. Can you imagine out of the th almost half a million people who lived to that show, God, out of that, the needle in a haystack, chose this gal to do something special in her life? Isn't that amazing? Yeah. <laughs> now, uh, Mara, uh, you came to that class. Why? Because of the the subject. I never I never heard of it before. I never heard of you know anything that had to do with these. And and when Doctor Doctor Richard said, if if any of you have stuff going on in your life, and would like help, and would like to be a guinea pig for the class, what did you do? me I'll do it he gave us a list of all the issues that somebody you know if you have this if you have that if this has happened to you and I said what if I have them all <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah so I volunteer so Mara came and she actually spent uh, two hours in our class and we all watched and I know more about her story than she does do you know why because I don't remember anything <laughs> Folks, you just heard something profound. In the class, Mara had all sorts of issues concerning abuse, concerning a child that died, related to a whole number of things, related to drugs and that. And it was so painful, the whole two hours, she was literally crying because the pain was so great, but yet, as she saw Jesus in that situation being hurt with her, it touched her heart. And at the end of the session, the last prayer, Dr. Kraft, I don't know if you remember this, but the last prayer you prayed for her was, Lord, heal her memories and take away the pain of that hurt. And what did God do? I don't remember the session at all. <laughs> so, Isn't that great? I, I, know the issues that I have had in the past and um, and I you know I can give you a list but just like I can give you a grocery list it doesn't have any emotional attachment it doesn't have any it doesn't affect me in, in any way like like it used to before and so and the session itself I only remember the very beginning when he has us um, think about before in heaven with Jesus before being born that's the only okay. part of tell, the session tell that us I remember. that story because uh Dr. Kraft, I think you mentioned that our memories of what happened start even before birth. So tell us about that. Well, in the session, he asks you to um, think of, of yourself in Jesus' arms um, or in God's arms in heaven. And, um, and I just, I remember me being very little, more like a, maybe a, a one or a two year old looking and thinking, no, I don't want to. I don't want to be born. I, I I rather stay here. I rather stay here. That's that's what I envision, or that what came to mind when he was asking me to do that. And and that's the only part that I that I really remember of the whole session. Some of you may not realize this, but what may have happened in your life 
the feelings of worthlessness you have may have come because your parents didn't want you. And you have picked up that spirit of rejection that has lived in your life and destroyed much of it. But Mara, are you glad to be set free now? Oh, yes. All oh, right. Yes. <laughs> thank Give you. Mara a hand. OK, thank you. All right, I need to do something that James forgot to do. Would all of our kiddos that are out uh, going to their classes, would you're dismissed right now. Give the kids a hand as they go. Awesome. Uh, I have the privilege of introducing a man who's become a friend and a man that God has used mightily. He's been a missionary. And he's 81 years old. What do you do when you get around a wise old man? You sit and listen. Okay. What you're going to hear this morning is going to be life transformational, if you'll pay attention to what is said. Dr. Kraft is a missionary. He has been involved at Fuller Seminary, teaching the only courses in this field that we've been studying, the spirit world. He's been teaching the courses there. He's written numerous books. He's just done a wonderful work for God in terms of helping people be free from all the work of the enemy. We've had a three-week series on the spirit world, and the fourth week is today, and I can't think of a better man to close this series in the spirit world than a man I call my friend. And by the way, when I was dealing with some folks here, I said to the demons, spoke to the demons and said, I'm going to send you to see Dr. Kraft. And the demons said, we don't like Dr. Kraft. So I want you to welcome a man whose name not only is known in heaven, it's known in hell. <laughs> Dr. Kraft. <laughs> I must say, I've never been introduced like that before. <laughs> what do you do after that? I don't know whether I'll, uh, I'll start out standing up. But my legs get tired. So. Yeah, my, uh, one of my sons was uh, at a meeting one time where they were advertising uh, Fuller Seminary and trying to uh, recruit uh, students and uh, <clears throat> my son took his 10 year old son to uh, the, uh, the the booth that uh, that Fuller had set up and uh, <clears throat> introduced himself and uh, the uh, the fellow that was tending the booth said oh that dr. Kraft he's he's famous uh, my 10 uh, year old grandson looked up and said He's just grandpa, so I'm I'm just uh, I'm just grandpa. Um, it's a, a pleasure to be with you and and uh, to uh, hopefully contribute to uh, some of your understanding and uh, your uh, your living. My uh, my topic is uh, ten myths concerning demonization. Ten, uh, ten myths, ten things that are uh, that are wrong, and I'm going to start with the scripture, John 14. Uh, this is the uh, these are the last few days of, of Jesus' ministry, and he's uh, he's speaking to his disciples and uh, teaching them the the things that uh, he wants them to remember. And you come to. Uh, in John 14, you come to verse 12, and uh, 
He says, I am telling you the truth, which further underlines the, the teaching. Those who believe in me will do what I do. Yes, they will do even greater things because I am going to the Father. Now, what does that mean? We're going to, and Jesus is predicting that we will do the things that he did. Um, what are the things that he did? Well, he did a lot of time. He spent a lot of time teaching. And uh, so he predicts that we're going to be teaching, uh, teaching disciples. But he also spent a lot of time healing and casting out demons. Um, how many of you have cast out demons? Doesn't look like very many, huh? Um, I've probably had about 2,000 experiences one-on-one, -on -one, uh, most of which were, uh, they involved what we call the garbage, but they also involved the rats. The rats are the, are the demons. And uh, <clears throat> by the time you've done this quite a while, you uh, begin to believe in it. <laughs> But Jesus said, if we have faith in him, we're going to do what he did. So one of the important things that, he's, that he was doing um, is dealing with demonic stuff. Apparently, it was fairly common in his day for people to be demonized. Um, and uh, <clears throat> it's kind of interesting. A lot of the people that he dealt with turned up in church. Uh, they call it the synagogue in those days. Um, but uh, apparently when he was teaching, there was so much Holy Spirit presence that the demons couldn't resist revealing themselves. Ordinarily, they hide. Ordinarily, they don't want to, uh, to be discovered. But uh, I think there was so much Holy Spirit power there that they were forced to reveal themselves. So I want to talk about the things that we believe, the, the myths that we believe, the mistakes that we believe concerning demonization in hopes that uh, maybe some or it'd be nice if it was all of you would get into this, this business of freeing people from demons. You see, there's two big um, events in the Christian's life. The first one, of course, is salvation. The second one is freedom. And it's been my observation that lots and lots of people who are wonderfully saved never get free. They've taken, they've, they've been through that first big thing, getting saved, but they haven't gotten to the second one, uh, getting free. And people come regularly to my, my office. Um, I have an office in Pasadena where we um, have people come uh, scheduled for uh, two-hour appointments, and uh, most of them are carrying demons. Uh, they don't look like it. Uh, one of the problems that uh, I'll talk a little bit about is that um, people expect demons to put on a big show, and they very seldom do that unless they're unless they're outed, unless the the Holy Spirit uh, is brought, and uh, <clears throat> they can't resist. Now, I was having a discussion one time with a couple of pastors, and uh, we were discussing spiritual warfare. And um, one of the pastors, I'll call him George, he says, uh, I've, been, I've been having this problem with fear. He said, I've, I've just uh, been uh, fearful all my life, and uh, I don't know what to do about it. Um, do you think it might be demonic? So I looked at him and talked past him. I said, if there's a spirit of fear here, in the name of Jesus, I'm challenging you. This man belongs to Jesus Christ. He does not belong to you. And so I break your power and send you to Jesus. George blinked his eyes and said, it's gone. I don't know how he knew, but he said he knew it was gone. He said, my fear is gone. Um, 
Now, our temptation as Westerners and Americans, we would, our temptation would be to explain this um, naturalistically. Uh, say, okay, he had a psychological problem and um, we were, that's what we were dealing with, um, which is partly true because everything happens at two levels, including this church service. Use your imagination. What do you suppose is going on in heaven right now while we're here? See, that's the spiritual side. The human side is we come to church, we sit in these seats, we listen to uh, lectures that we call sermons, uh, we worship, we do these various things. This is all at the human level. But in the, what they say, what they call the heavenlies in the spirit world, there is something going on there. It may be a fight between evil spirits and um, God's uh, spirit uh, because we're honoring God by coming to worship. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> for this time that we're here worshiping, we win. You might not win when you go home, but we win here because the enemy spirit world cannot handle more than so much uh, attack on, on them. The, the songs that we sing, this wonderful worship uh, thing that we've just gone through, this is a threat to, to Satan. And it's sort of like the spirits that would um, ordinarily be with us, they had to leave, they had to, uh, it's sort of like they waited outside the door for us to pick them up when we leave. <laughs> Uh, that's not a decent, decent thought, is it? Uh, uh, but it, 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 is, uh, it is sort of like that. Uh, what, we, what we do here, honoring Jesus Christ, uh, keeps the spirits from doing their, uh, their ordinary work, at least for this, this hour. Now, I've got 10 of these things that we believe, and the first one is Christians cannot be demonized. How many of you have heard that message? Anybody that's, that's heard that? There are whole denominations that believe that Christians can't be demonized. Guess what their churches are full of? <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> See, I've dealt with a couple of thousand Christians, uh, most of whom were carrying demons. We kicked the demons out, and their life changed. Um, that seems like reality. So my theory is that Christians can have demons. And then I look at the New Testament. See, Jesus cast out a lot of demons. Who did he cast them out from? Well, these were people who came to Jesus in faith. They came with the faith that he could help them. What do we call people who come to Jesus in faith? Okay, believers, we call them Christians, right? You've come here in faith as an expression of your faith in Jesus Christ. Um, so when, when you look at, the, look at this, you find out that Jesus was casting demons out of Christians. They weren't called Christians yet because he hadn't gone through the uh, death and resurrection part. But these are people of faith, we call them Christians. Now, is there any evidence in our society that uh, people might be demonized? Unfortunately, there is a lot of, of evidence because they behave in an evil way. And who's the father of the evil? Satan. So, <clears throat> this myth is I think easy to uh, dispel if you get into uh, dealing with, with demonization, that Christians can be demonized. Now, we have to have some kind of a theory then, how can uh, people who have the Holy Spirit living within them, how can they be demonized? People say to me, you, you can't have, people can't have both the Holy Spirit and, and demons because Demons cannot live where the Holy Spirit is. And I said, how about life around us? God's Spirit is here, and so are demons. 
they're living in the same place, the same atmosphere uh, together. And uh, <clears throat> so in the culture as a whole, you've got the Holy Spirit and demons inhabiting the same territory. Is it too much of a stretch to believe that they can do that internally too? Now, I, I like to talk about it on, on two hands. Um, all of us have a spirit part. This is the part that, uh, um, that sinned when Adam sinned. This is the part that comes to Jesus. And I believe that that part of us is sinless. But we still have sin as Christians in body, mind, emotions, and will. Those four areas, we still struggle with sin. It's neat to know that, uh, that one area is uh, sin-free, but those other four areas are, can be pretty, uh, pretty active. Okay, if there's demonization, demons get kicked out of the spirit part of us. I've asked uh, demons over and over again, um, do you live in this person's spirit? No. Did you used to live there? Oh, yes. When did you have to get out? They give me the date of their conversion. September 29th, 1963. I see, that's a little bit longer than, farther back than you can remember, maybe. Uh, <laughs> but they'll, they'll give you the date, or they'll say, when Jesus came in, I had to get out of the person's spirit. Or when the Holy Spirit came, came in. Um, one of them said to me, uh, she, um, whenever I test her, she goes to her best friend, the Holy Spirit, and I can't get her. Poor spirit. You can't get her because she goes to the Holy Spirit. But we can still have demons in body, mind, emotions, and will. They're kicked out of that central part of us, but we still have to fight with them. Uh, this, is, this is my take on how, how it is that, that uh, Christians can have demons. A second myth, a second lie, is that people are possessed by demons. You've all heard this, the uh, phrase demon possession. Is it interesting to you that that is not scriptural? There's nothing in this, the biblical words that allows for that translation. See, the, the, the original New Testament was in Greek, and the words dealing with demonization are, uh, mean something like, he has a demon. Has a demon is quite different from being possessed by a demon. But the, that's all they mean is has a demon. Now, I say, okay, people can have a demon, but sometimes the demons are stronger and sometimes they're weaker. So I think of a scale of one to 10. One being weakest, ten being strongest. And when when I deal with uh, with demons, uh, the person comes usually has demons of a maybe a four or five on a scale of ten. Um, you know that you've got a, a certain amount of of uh, uh, of power there. Uh, the most uh, <clears throat> most powerful uh, deal of demonization in the New Testament is in Mark five, where the, uh, where Jesus landed on the beach and this man came and knelt down in front of him. Uh, this man was full of demons. He asked the demon's name. They said, Legion, for we are many. Well, Legion is thousands. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, they said, uh, the, the demon said to Jesus, don't send us out of this region. Why would they say that? Well, I believe they said that because this region, they were territorial spirits inhabiting this region. So they said to Jesus, send us into the pigs. So he sent them into the pigs, and guess what? The border of the region was at the, at the uh, uh, where the water came. So the pigs took them out of the region. Now I like to kid around a lot and say this is the first, uh, first known case of deviled ham. <laughs> You, you 
you may not remember anything I say here except that uh, little joke. <laughs> but Jesus sent them into the pigs. The pigs took them into the water, which took them out of the region, and they lost. Uh, demons make mistakes like that sometimes. Um, but people are not possessed by demons, although that, that man would have come close. Um, people have demons, and the demons are of varying um, strength. Um, so that's the second myth that people are possessed. So we, we don't use the term possessed. We usually say the person has a demon or the person is demonized. Uh, we transliterate the Greek word daimonizomai, and we say that person is demonized, which means a demon is living inside that person. Now, a third myth is uh, a deliverance always entails a big fight. Have you heard of people who are demonized that they, they fight like mad and they, their eyes roll back and all this kind of thing? Um, uh, that's true in some cases, but it, it's true because people have assumed that the demons are the big problem. The demons are not the big problem. The demons are the little problem. It's rats and garbage. Suppose you've got rats in your house and you kick the rats out, but don't do anything about the garbage that attracted them. What happens? They come right back. But suppose you say, okay, we got rats in this house. The way to get rid of them is to get rid of the garbage. And so they go about getting rid of the garbage. Then the rats have nothing more to feed on and they're easy to get rid of. And when you get rid of them, they stay. They don't, they don't come back because they don't have any more food to, to feed. Now, this analogy is, uh, I think, very, uh, very close to what happens with us and, uh, and demons. If we have stuff in our lives that attracts the demons, they can be here. But you take care of that stuff, and the demons have no more food to, to attract them. And it's easy to kick them out, and when they get kick them out, then they stay out. You get the picture, it's rats and garbage. Um, <clears throat> now, when, when we deal with things this way, by the time we get around to dealing with the demons, they have no more power left. So I've had these hundreds of cases with no, rat, no uh, uh, violence or uh, fighting at all, because you take away the stuff, the power is gone, and they have to go. Um, now, we have the authority to, uh, to do that, but it, it depends on what, what order you, uh, you do it in. If you uh, deal with the demons first and then with the, with the garbage, uh, you're likely to get a fight because they're strong. They've got plenty of garbage to feed on. But you take that garbage away from them, and they get weak. And so the, the proper order, I think, is deal with the garbage first, then get to the demons. And uh, in my own ministry, I make two-hour appointments. I spend the first hour um, dealing with the garbage. Um, now, what do I mean by garbage? I mean things like, um, well, many of us have been cursed. I won't ask for a show of hands, but probably many of you have cursed yourselves. That gives the demons a, a right. Um, emotional and spiritual problems like anger and uh, bitterness and fear and shame. There's a whole long list in um, a couple of my books uh, of uh, these emotional reactions. Now, in Ephesians 4, it says, when you are angry, don't sin. Don't give the devil a chance. Did Jesus get angry? Say yes. yes. <laughs> Remember when he cast out the money changers? I mean, this is these were human beings, and he um, he managed to get rid of them with a with a, nothing more than a rope uh, in his hand. But see, Jesus got angry, but then he immediately gives the anger to God. 
and the demons can't get them. It's people who keep the anger that provides the garbage that the demons have a right to come and feed on. Same thing with fear. People who keep the fear. Uh, same thing with shame. If you keep the shame, any of these things, by rules of the universe, give the enemy the right to come and live inside us. And these rules are just as firm as the law of gravity. They happen whether we believe in it or not. Uh, you can't uh, uh, you know, say, I'm going to jump out of this window on the fifth, fifth floor and it's not going to hurt me because I don't believe in the law of gravity. <laughs> See, whether you believe in the law of gravity or not, it's going to happen. <laughs> and uh, the same with these, uh, uh, with these laws. Uh, in the spirit world, the relationship between the spirit world and the human world, there are, uh, there are laws, there are rights. Now, I don't have any violence because I minister exclusively to Christians. Uh, I work only with persons who are eager to be healed. Um, I start each session by forbidding any demons to, uh, to mess around with it, whatever Jesus wants to do. And so we have these, uh, these ways of, of handling things. Now this fourth lie that I wanted to talk about is that demonization is simply psychological illness. Uh, liberals uh, tend to, to believe this. Unfortunately, many evangelicals do as well, that Jesus was a good psychologist. He simply accommodated to people by calling, psycho uh, calling demons a psychological problem. Uh, or calling a psychological problem uh, demons. Um, well, that's a problem. Uh, except that psychological problems don't carry on conversations. There are certain psychological problems where the person hears voices, but those aren't carrying out conversations. Those are, um, those are simply, uh, simply voices. A demon can carry on conversation uh, with you. Um, it's kind of interesting. There, there are all kinds of things that the uh, uh, that the demons say. Um, I asked one time. Uh, I said, uh, why, "What gives you a right to be in this person?" And the demon said, "Her sister." I said to the person, uh, "Do you need to forgive your sister?" And she said, oh, yeah, I, I forgot. I, I need to forgive my sister. She forgave her sister. That took the demon's power away, and we kicked him out. That's a, that's a regular kind of a, uh, of a, uh, th a scenario of things that, uh, that happen. Um, demons are not simply a psychological problem. Now, people like to ask me, is this, is this a psychological problem or demonization? I say, yes. They look at me again. They say, which is it? I say, both. You see, there's, there's two levels. There's the human level, there's the spirit level. Everything going on at the human level has implications at the spirit level. Now, we don't know very much about that, and the Bible doesn't talk a whole lot about it. In, in Job, we get the conversation between Satan and, and God, and uh, a few other places. In Daniel, uh, we get uh, the, what the, what's called the Prince of Persia, who was a, a territorial spirit in charge of the the country of, of Persia. Uh, there are a few places where the, the curtain gets pulled back and we get uh, insight into what's going on in the, in the spirit world. Uh, the, uh, the one in Daniel is scary because this is a, uh, see, Daniel prayed, God answered his prayer, gave the answer to this angel, and it took that angel three weeks to get to Daniel. <laughs> kind of interesting. And Daniel was one of the heroes of faith. If it took three weeks to get Daniel his answer, it would probably take me three years <laughs> to, to get, a, uh, get an answer. Uh, but uh, when we try to, try to figure out what's going on in the spirit world, we, we're often left with more questions than, than answers, uh, except to be able to say there is stuff going on in the spirit world while we're here in church. It's as if the, the top has been opened and uh, we have a direct connection with him, with God. Myth number five, those with demons are guilty of spiritual rebellion. 
I was dealing with a pastor one time, a Presbyterian pastor, and um, I said, uh, you've, probably, you've probably got a demon. He said, I, I don't think I've ever done anything bad enough to attract a demon. I said, well, you probably inherited him. And that's indeed what turned out to be the case. When we claim the power of God to break any power that the enemy has through inheritance, the demon, his power was gone and it was easy to, to kick him out. Uh, but lots of people are, you know, have, have uh, done things or inherited things or whatever that uh, give the enemy rights. So they're not necessarily, that is demonized people are not necessarily guilty of spiritual rebellion. Uh, there are people who are guilty of spiritual rebellion, and that does attract a demon, but that's not the only uh, kind of a situation. Myth number six, problems are either demonic or emotional. And here's where uh, they ask me, uh, is it a demon or is it uh, an emotion? And I say yes, uh, because we're working at, uh, at two, uh, two levels. Demons cannot create anything they can only jump on something that is already there. So if we have the garbage that attracts the demon, then the demons can get in. If that garbage is taken care of, then it's easy to kick them out. Then some people go to the opposite extreme, and uh, you may have met some of them, saying all emotional problems are caused by demons. Uh, this, is, um, this is wrong as well. Um, especially if you deal with the emotional problems. And uh, we've, got, uh, we've got shrinks, um, psychologists, who uh, specialize in getting people half healed. They deal real well with the human stuff, but they don't get to the spiritual stuff. You've got to deal with both of them to get the, uh, uh, get the person free. Myth number eight, only those with special gifting can cast out demons. Did Jesus' disciples have special gifting? They were just common, ordinary people. And there's nothing said about gifting. Now the impression we get is that obedience precedes gifting. We discover our gifts in the process of ministry. Because Jesus said, we're all going to, going to do what he did. So we are to obey that. Then as we obey it, we find that we have authority over demons. Does that make sense? Say yes. Otherwise, I'll have to change my notes. <laughs> I'm not going to do that right now. Uh, I often use my own self as a, uh, as a case here. Um, there are people that I have known that get visions. I don't get visions. There are people that get what we call words of knowledge. Uh, they'll be in a room and they'll be able to pick out people that have a certain, uh, a certain problem or they'll be able to, to talk to a, a person and say, the, the Holy Spirit has showed me that this is your, your problem. I don't get any of that. I just obey. <laughs> and. Uh, <clears throat> God is pleased to use me, and that's a uh, that's a marvelous thing, uh, given the fact that I used to have a self-image that was pretty uh, pretty pathetic. Um, in spite of that, when we learn the authority that we have in Jesus Christ and our relationship with with Him, we're able to do little things. See, the, uh, Jesus sent the disciples out to uh, to the villages in in Luke 10. And he said, wherever you go, uh, knock on the door, announce that you're, uh, you're here, and uh, uh, then come back and report to me. They came back to him, and he, they said, hey, wow, even the demons obey us. And Jesus said, that's not so hot. Anybody can do that. The big thing is your names are written in heaven. Casting out demons is the little thing. But we all can do it and all should be doing it because there's lots of demonization going on. There's lots of people that are carrying demons. They think maybe it's a psychological problem or an emotional problem or uh, whatever. But people who uh, get angry 
and hold on to that anger, get demons. People who are fearful and hold on to that fear, by laws of the universe, demons have a right to come and live in that thing. I don't agree with that law, uh, but Jesus didn't consult me when he made it. <laughs> I got a lot of questions to ask him when we get to heaven. <laughs> uh, but he's, he's made a lot, of, uh, a lot of laws like that that uh, we just have to de deal with. Now, myth number nine, here's a good one. Demonization is uncommon in the United States because we have so many churches, we have so many people that are believers um, that uh, that stuff in Washington, D.C. that looks demonic, that, that's really just human stuff. I have this theological response to that, baloney. <laughs> that's a good theological word, <laughs> baloney. There's plenty of evidence all, all over. Uh, <clears throat> even even the, the police and, and the journalists oftentimes know more about demonization than, the, than church people. Um, and you've got uh, a variety of occult establishments, um, astrologers and palm readers and psychics and fortune tellers, all working in the power of Satan. Uh, there's Scientologists, um, Freemasonry, Christian Science, Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses, Buddhism, Islam, Yoga, Karate, Tai Chi. All of these are uh, expressions of uh, demonization. And they're working here whether we agree or not, whether we believe it or, or not. Um, the uh, police, the, the world of, of police and uh, journalists um, often have uh, come up with uh, satanic symbols. Do you remember the guy that was called the Night Stalker, uh, Richard Ramirez? Um, was he demonized or not? Uh, heavily. Um, how about uh, Son of Sam, Richard Berkowitz, uh, another demonized person. And even secular sources would, would uh, refer to them as demonic. Uh, there was a, a while back a, a, a discovery that a lot of child care centers were involved in sexual abuse. Is that demonic? Yep. Um, there was a, a, a death of a family along the Texas-Mexican border. Uh, it looked like a ritual. Uh, there are Satanists, there are New Age uh, people. So there's plenty of that stuff in, in our country and then, of course, uh, around the world as well. Now, at last, this last point. I know that sermons are supposed to be only three points, but I'm a teacher more than a preacher, so I can have 10 points. The demonized speak in different voices. Uh, you look at the, the, the movies uh, like The Exorcist and so on, they, they always have the, the demon speaking in a low guttural uh, kind of a voice. Uh, that can happen, especially if you deal with demonization before you deal with the inner healing. If you assume that the demons are the big problem and go after them before you do anything else, you can get uh, different voices. I've, I've heard uh, different voices, but most of the time, if you go at it the way I'm suggesting, deal with the garbage, and then the rats have, uh, have no more power. They also have no, no power to change the voice. Uh, sometimes they'll, uh, they'll speak a different language. Um, I've heard American Indian languages. I've uh, had one, one case where uh, this person, I was dealing with this person in English. Somebody came up from behind and spoke Spanish, and the demon spoke Spanish to him. Somebody else came up and spoke Ger German. He spoke German. Now, I don't know if all demons can uh, speak in any language they want to, uh, but at least some can, uh, uh, can use, use other languages. So they have, have various ways of deceiving uh, us, but they don't always speak in uh, a different voice. Well, 
I hope this has been uh, helpful to you. Uh, I've got uh, eight going on nine books on the subject, uh, some of which were being sold somewhere around here, out in the uh, patio out there, I guess. Uh, and we do seminars and uh, try to uh, inform people and to get people to uh, do uh, doing ministry. And I have the counseling office uh, where people make appointments uh, with me, um, and uh, we we get them uh, get them free. So it's uh, <clears throat> this is part of my take on uh, on demonization, and uh, I submit it to you in the name of Jesus. And uh, I would like to see every one of you get into this ministry because we've got lots and lots of people that need it. Um, we have training programs as well. So <clears throat> contact us through, through me email. It's just ccraft at fuller.edu, and uh, we can set you up with whatever you need. Let's, uh, let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for the privilege of uh, representing you in this way. And I ask you to uh, meet with, with these, your people, and to uh, uh, bring the challenge to them that they, uh, that they will get, uh, get to understand better what uh, the enemy's devices are and be able to participate in defeating him. So we offer this in, in your name and thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.